afternoon, and uh, you'll be happy to know, as I say, you've made it through the day to the final uh, speaker, so hopefully we can finish on quite an important talk for yourselves. Um, for as long as I can remember, I've always wanted to become an architect. Um, picture me as a young boy, around five or six, full of Essex innocence and charm, long before the only way is Essex hit the TV screens. My teachers and my parents would both ask me what I wanted to do when I grew up, and I'm pretty confident at this age I didn't actually know what an architect was. It was a long word and it sounded impressive, so it would do it at the time. Um, after telling too many people this is what I wanted to do, I then had to endure seven years of uh, university torture just to save face. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So I was always fascinated by the man-made environment and how things were constructed and designed. Um, and I soon became extremely fascinated by the actual industry itself, proving that it was the right decision to, to start studying. As I grew old, I began to notice the, uh, the interaction between us and the relationship between us as individuals and how architecture and our environments shape our day-to-day -day experiences and ultimately shape how we live our lives. Um, I began to realize that architecture was an extremely powerful tool um, with the ability to influence someone's perception, behavior, and mood. During my studies, my elder sister developed two life-changing conditions. Uh, these both affected her eyes, and they both resulted in a gradual but uh, guaranteed loss of sight. Um, at the age of 45, uh, she'd lost 90% of her eyesight. Um, so I'd often visit her, and I began to really notice her struggles with navigating her home, which is essentially an environment that she's been very comfortable with for the last 10 years and knows extremely well. Um, up until then, I'd not seen firsthand how much of a struggle it could be for someone with a disability to navigate our environments. Um, so I began to research a little bit further into what tools were available to me as a, a, an architect in, in training to see how I could make her environment and indeed uh, everyone's environment that little bit more comfortable. And I soon realized that it wasn't just those with disabilities that were struggling to experience our cityscapes. Um, I've become very attuned to what is known as hostile architecture. Um, for those who haven't come across this form of architecture, hostile architecture is the use of architectural um, components that deter the use of a specific space or, or environment. Um, they make it very hard for someone to access a particular area. They're often hidden behind a form of uh, functionality, um, or a facade of form and functionality, and in recent times, you probably would have seen the metal spikes appearing in recesses to flats uh, and sort of cre crevices that a homeless individual would actually sleep in for, for some security. Um, there was also a movement last year, I believe, where park benches were having single uh, armrests installed retrospectively of their design. Um, this again was specifically to deter a homeless individual from the ability to lie down. It became apparent to me that beautifully designed architectural spaces were becoming extremely exclusive and only available to those who could afford an architect service. Um, and this is setting out how to, dis to, to make my sister's life a little bit easier. I discovered that the design, in, or the design world um, and industry was using their power of how to shape someone's uh, spaces to exclude social groups from the environment. Historically, Designers have tried to limit who they design for uh, by either excluding from their social circles or the client's social circles their designs. Uh, for those people who the design actually accommodate, there's been no uh, complaints, of course. Um, but the common thread between all this hostile um, and aggressive features was the fact that it directly affected those sleeping rough and the more undesirable of our communities. Now, I'm fully aware that not everybody has specifically designed with intent people out of their environments. Um, but I do believe it is more so the evolution of design principles that have led to this form of architecture becoming the norm. Um, it's simply a design trend of who do we want here and who do we not want here. Um, and I've been totally shocked by how exclusive and hostile our environments actually are. Um, I touched earlier on the public bench. This is when we, we speak about homeless individuals, we often think of them sleeping on park benches. Um, the park bench has become ex 
increasingly uh, aggressive over the last few years. Um, with design briefs actually telling us to design benches that only allow perching rather than sitting for long periods of time. Um, I was amazed at the great limits that were undertaken to actually stop someone from lying down on a park bench. This bench here, uh, outside the Royal Courts of Justice in London, extremely prominent London area, um, central London, full of tourists. They thought a good idea to deter the homeless from sleeping there, making the area look untidy, would to be to install uh, these, these spikes and these fins, which is uh, completely barbaric in my opinion. Um, this bench in front of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral had a man-made wooden separator of some sort added specifically to stop someone from sleeping there. And this one actually makes me laugh because it is, uh, it's really poorly built as well. Uh, in some cases, benches have become completely isolated to single seats. Um, again, adding to the segregation and the isolation of an individual. Um, and there's been a movement, as I said earlier, of benches designed specifically to hurry people on for our environments and actually stop them from staying for longer than 15 minutes. Uh, the Camden bench, designed with around 27 different seating positions, but all only to enable you to, to perch or lean or against the, the bench itself. Um, and the, it wasn't just park benches that have these hostile um, elements. Uh, you've got bus stops with sloped seats, again, making it uncomfortable to stay for longer periods, uh, periods of time. You have uh, phone booths, all with large openings at the bottom to allow cold air in and stop it from becoming a warm, secure space. Um, we touched on the spikes, and you even have uh, building window reveals and seals sloped specifically, again, to stop someone from residing and getting some security out of the, of, of the windows de depth there. Um, and these components are only part of a larger spatialized environmental um, control device. So the question arose to me is do architects actually have the skills and the attitude needed to change our environments and design truly inclusive environments? Uh, and when I speak about inclusive design, um, it's a design that can be accessed by every individual regardless of their, their race, their social class, their disabilities, their age, gender, and so on and so forth. <coughs> And it's not just relevant to buildings, it's relevant to the actual open spaces that we experience. I believe that every individual has the right to beautifully design space. <clears throat> and I found myself asking, how could I then apply the skill set that I am learning to change our environments and, and try to help remove these underlying hostile elements that generally the general public are completely unaware of, as I was for, for many years before. And this obviously relates directly to the homelessness issue. Um, so architects design homes, homeless individuals need homes. I'm no Sherlock Holmes, but I could see the correlation between the, uh, the, my, my career and the crisis at hand. Um, history is full of examples of how architecture has used, been used to create segregation and separation. Um, and throughout the years, it is apparent that design is uh, guided by a series of rules and regulations. And, and spatial theories as well. So then the challenge for me was how can I then combat this hostile uh, design? How can I create something that works within these confines of uh, these theories and these regulations? <clears throat> so I began to look at creating something that the homeless people need, which is a shelter. Uh, the first thing for me to do was strip back the fundamentals of what was required and actually speak to a homeless individual direct to see what it was they wanted out of my concepts. Um, on my list I had the obvious selection, so we had some heat, some warmth, some walls, a floor, some insulation, all the standard things that you'd expect from a, uh, from a hut. But the one thing that really got me was, and it was the most common answer, it was a place to escape the glaring stare of the general public. They wasn't worried about design details or gimmicks, they just wanted some privacy. Um, and I wondered, I thought to myself, how demoralizing must it be to know that everybody that stares at you sees you as an undesirable within their community and sees you as somewhere that you don't belong. Um, couple this with all the devices such as the spikes that we are then implementing in their environments and our environments, and you've potentially got the uh, recipe and ingredients to, to call someone to want to take their own life, in my opinion. And, and what really 
um, got to me was I had personally been guilty of walking past a homeless individual, feeling uncomfortable and turning away or pretending to look at my phone. And I don't know how honest you guys are, but um, I'm sure many of you have done the same thing because it is what we see as normal, it is what makes us uncomfortable. I was unaware that a simple act of acknowledgement could actually change someone's day and in fact someone's life um, if we all began to acknowledge them as part of our community. So my shelters are not provided simply for uh, the necessities. I've designed them to cause controversy. I've designed them so that the, the concept of, of, or the issue of homelessness becomes uh, current and is at the forefront of everybody's conversation. I wanted to test the boundaries of what was known as normality and test the boundary of the norm. Uh, the norm that is hostile architecture, the norm that is uh, created by ourselves to, for us to then think it's okay to ignore a homeless individual or not give them any change that we might not need simply because we assume they're going to purchase some cigarettes, drugs and alcohol on that. Um, <clears throat> so to create controversy, I played with form, I played with materials, I played with scale. Anything that I could do that I knew would sort of scare people, essentially. Um, I knew they could be quite beautiful, but I also knew that it'd have to be something that would really set people back. But I soon realized it wasn't actually what they looked like that was the issue. It was the use of them. And it was the fact that I was designing for somebody that people thought was undesirable that caused the issues. So I looked at my, my concept, um, Homes for the Homeless, uh, aptly named. Um, I played with the metaphors of raising an individual up above the negativity of the general public um, and proposed to attach the existing shelters to, uh, the shelters to existing hosts to be able to tap into their energies, their electricities, their heats. Um, access by ladders, uh, the pods are able to create a place of sense, wor self, sense worth and self and self worth and, and security, um, privacy, warmth, all the standard requirements. Now, this was specifically to scare the general public. It was a test. Um, do you think they liked it? Of course not. People were telling me they didn't want this on the side of their houses and the side of their buildings. Um, it was greeted with complete fear, um, but it didn't bother me. Um, after all. This was specifically as a test. So I then went on to look at, um, with the platform that this had provided me, how to provide concepts and schemes that were slightly more recognizable in form. Uh, so I moved on to, to what I call the homeless beacon. Um, still looking at raising people above the floor, uh, but I played with different lighting effects, different types of materials, and I pictured these along the Thames river, creating an illuminated boardwalk, um, highly illuminated when, when empty and then when in use, dipped, so you get a really beautiful variance of, um, of lighting, uh, creating a nice lit safe walkway along, along the river. <clears throat> so then I moved on to my next series of schemes and each shelter is, is born from its predecessor, so each test gives me some more um, scope on design and I can rein it in because um, Ultimately, I need to, to conceive something that is uh, achievable and, and can be built. Um, so the beach hut shelter uses familiar forms um, of the beach hut. Again, aptly named, I'm really creative with my names. Um, constructed using prefabricated timber A-frames, uh, they can be adapted and changed. Cost less than £1,700 each to construct. Um, they can be put in small clusters, they can put in large communities, um, easily dismantled and relocated. Uh, using a self-policing system, the shelters can be used to create a sense of worth and ownership. Um, they can be used as incentives for integration should someone have uh, an issue with drugs or alcohol. And they, and they could be reintegration or a stage of reintegration into standard uh, normality. Uh, so two layers of polycarbonate fireproof material will create a really warm inter internal space. Um, which then provide the necessities for someone to sleep. Again, we're not looking at a five-star hotel. We're looking for the, basics, uh, the basic needs that we as individuals have the right to experience. Uh, and these can be adapted. They can be standalone. They can be completely self-sufficient with certain po uh, solar panels and plumbing installed, should they need to be. Um, but the issue of homelessness is much more complex than simply providing a temporary 
shelter for somebody. Uh, prevention is the ultimate solution. Um, and I believe that the governments need to make affordable housing accessible to begin the prevention of people becoming homeless on the streets. In this day and age, um, we as an industry should be making an effort to create environments that encourage uh, social interaction, integration and communication. Uh, places that celebrate diversity. Uh, because the lack of grounded uh, architectural spaces for individuals that are actually looking for a home is, is truly distressing. Um, there's an opportunity for us as designers to think outside of the box. Um, when it comes to rethinking design, um, conventional architecture provides us with a, a blank canvas of different possibilities. Um, so we can look at different ways of innovation uh, and inclusivity within the built environment. Uh, we need to continually challenge perceptions of what is considered normal and conventional in architecture but only by challenging or even removing this, this concept of the norm and normality uh, can we then widen our capabilities as designers um, to then design environments that better suit all of us, in, in all honesty, and not just those with disabilities or that are homeless. All of us that experience these environments should be experiencing them with, with joy and, 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 in, and fun. Um, I truly believe that great design is accessible to, to all classes and all sectors of society. Um, by accepting that all people, regardless of their community, um, and they should all have the same opportunities. We should, we should all be able to participate within society. So architecture then becomes a tool uh, where e we can create a world where everyone can participate equally. My shelters may, uh, have the ability to provide a temporary overnight solution um, for those sleeping rough, and it's my passion to continue to develop these until I can implement some, because we do have a crisis that needs to be addressed. Um, but if there's one thing that I want you guys to take away from, from my talk, um, it's that I want the societal norms to be challenged. Um, I understand we're not all architects, I understand we all have different uh, capabilities. Uh, and whilst I'm aware that I've spoken solely about challenging the norms in architecture, I truly believe it's something that all industries and us as individuals can work on. Um, just because something is normalised doesn't actually mean that it's right. Um, I think if we carry this mentality, um, with us as individuals, we can make huge advances in global crises such as uh, homelessness. Thank you.